Parkinson's um, with another episode of Pop Profiles. Uh, today we have Bill uh, Corsi here with us, um, who so kindly volunteered his time to share a story um, about his journey with Parkinson's disease. And to give you a little bit about Bill, he was born in Pennsylvania, but grew up and spent most of his time in Richmond, Virginia, really active in baseball and a lot, lots of different sports, um, particularly the Tuckahoe Little League and a coaching capacity. Um, he also worked in sales for many years um, in a sales capacity for many years before retiring. So Bill, thank you so much for being here with our pop profile and running through some questions with us and sharing your story. Absolutely, Margaret. Yeah, yeah. So tell us um, when you were diagnosed with Parkinson's. Diagnosed in 2003 after a kayak accident All right. in the ocean and I was, came out of the ocean shaking and all bloodied up and everybody said I better consult with the doctor and said they went through a battery of tests that sort of thing mm -hmm. determined that it was Parkinson's okay now did you start with your general practitioner or did you immediately see a neurologist so tell me about that journey well I went through um, my primary care initially okay. and then yep. got a forwarded over to a neurologist mm -hmm. in uh, at VCU and after several months of waiting to get in front of somebody I had an opportunity to get in front of somebody at UVA okay and um, so I stuck with them because they took me under their wing right away and and the rest is history very good so it sounds like it was maybe a six month process or so in terms of finding that it was indeed Parkinson's and validating that diagnosis or? About six months to nine months. Okay. Total and lots of trial and error with yeah, meds. Of course. And that sort of thing. Sure. Okay. Well, tell us how has your Parkinson's diagnosis affect your career? I know I touched on that you were, you are currently retired, but were you retired at the time? And tell us how that affected your work and career, et cetera. Well, I was involved with sales in various capacities, and I finally found that I wasn't able to have the salesmanship that I was used to providing the companies sure. because I was shaking so badly and, and couldn't understand how to control it. And mm -hmm. So yeah. I finally was convinced to retire by my wife. Sure, sure. Okay. Well, how do you explain to others what it means to have Parkinson's disease? I think it really means that it's, it takes you out of your comfort zone and what you're used to doing both athletically and mentally, and it puts you into a kind of a, a forced cage every morning when you wake up. Getting out of bed is much more difficult. Mm -hmm. um, talking is extremely difficult. Mm -hmm. um, and I think as you get into more high anxiety situations like cocktail parties that used to be my cup of tea mm -hmm. in sales became horror stories because I'd want to find a corner to go to just because I was shaking so badly mm -hmm. and wasn't able to keep my thoughts in order and that sort of thing. Sure, sure. Now when you explain uh, what it means to have Parkinson's to others, do you feel um, most people understand that or what's pe what's um, people's reaction to it? Do, they, do you feel like they understand some of the, the hidden things about Parkinson's as well? Well, I think uh, the biggest thing is, I think is the misnomer that if you aren't shaking, mm -hmm. then you really don't have Parkinson's very badly. Mm -hmm. And I don't shake like I used to shake because I have the deep brain stimulator in me and that sort of thing and so from that standpoint it's good but people started thinking that i was cured and that i should be able to go back to resuming all my sports activities sure and um and that wasn't the case at all because the shaking is only one aspect of the parkinson's mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. loss of balance loss of coordination um, muscle degradation mm -hmm are all parts of the process and influence your normal activities. Sure. I, I think what you touched on is important to note too, um, that upon DBS or, and or medicine, sometimes the symptoms are masks and people don't actually see that you indeed have a disease, um, but they don't 
they don't they don't understand a lot of things are behind the scenes, right? Or some things aren't visible. If the, there's some things beyond a tremor with Parkinson's disease. So I, I think right. it's great that you touched on that. And if it's okay to go off on a little bit of a tangent, you touched on DBS. Um, do you want to share a little bit about that journey when you had it and how you're feeling with it and walk us through that a little bit? I think it might be might resonate with others who have had it or are thinking about that's the next step. So can you talk to me a little bit about that? Well, I have one regret about the DBS, and that's that um, I waited so long to get it because mm -hmm. I was shaking so violently mm -hmm. on my left side of my body that it was making me feel as if I was running a constant marathon yeah. throughout the day. And I finally had the surgery, and I it was like a light switch when I went in to be turned on for the first time. Mm -hmm. the doctor said, "Watch this," and I was shaking pretty badly. Mm -hmm. They started punching a bunch of buttons. And all of a sudden, my tremors just stopped immediately. It's and incredible. then with that, they said, now watch this. And they started punching the same buttons again. And I started shaking. And I said, that's not funny. But they <laughs> yeah. were trying to show me how effective the system was with my yeah. setup. And, um, and yeah. I also had benefit of the honeymoon effect, which is I was getting benefit of the DBS just from the manipulation of the brain. Mm -hmm. prior to the actual turning on of the system. Mm -hmm. So I was getting all the good benefits of DBS right from the outset. Mm -hmm. And now I'm on limited medication throughout the day and shake very, very infrequently. And when I do, I can control it. Oh, that's, that's fantastic. It's amazing. Um, how long after your Parkinson's diagnosis did you get that DBS procedure? Oh, are you there, Bill? Are you there, Bill? There we go. You might need to repeat it because I think I lost you. Yep, you're fine. Uh, how long after your Parkinson's diagnosis did you end up getting the DBS procedure? Well, I was diagnosed in 2003 and got the procedure in 2012. Okay. It's about nine so, years. Uh, it was nine years of punishing activity. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's it's... It's a wonderful resource for the appropriate candidate. I think that's fantastic. And for those listening right now, um, it's something certainly to consider as uh, you deal with the, the more uh, intense tremors. Um, if we can move on, tell us a little bit about um, your care partner, who your support team is, your support person, a team, et cetera. Can you talk us through who's your, who's your inner circle? Well, my immediate family is my best support base, especially my wife, mm -hmm. bless her heart, who's upstairs right now in my office, communicating with her work and that sort yeah. of thing. Yeah. Um, but my immediate family are very protective of me and they know my limitations, know what I used to be able to do, and they accept what I can't do any longer. Mm -hmm. And um, and my next immediate family is my rock steady boxing family. Mm -hmm. And um, they are 100% in my corner every time I walk into the facility. Mm -hmm. I feel I'm in a safe zone and I feel that even at home now mm -hmm. with this COVID-19 issue. Yeah. Because I feel like I could reach out to any one of them at any point in time and get their immediate attention. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's fantastic. What a blessing that is. Um, tell me how you stay, and we touched on this earlier in terms of Parkinson's is not just a tremor and things that you can visibly see, but some things um, you can't see like uh, cognitive, cognitive ability. Um, so tell me a little bit about how you stay cognitively focused and as sharp as you can. Well, I think a lot of it is um, I'm not much of a reader, mm -hmm. but I get into crafts and hobbies, okay. and I get myself completely immersed in them. Um, as your father, Margaret, would know, mm -hmm. I've got a racetrack upstairs. It's 55 feet long, and it's got a whole village town that I've built up around it, and I meticulously design the buildings and, yeah. and the characters in the buildings and that sort of thing. And that's neat. So that keeps me mentally active. And, mm -hmm. and I find that um, as far as the physical activity, the rock steady boxing is 
probably the most important thing. Mm -hmm. Not only what I do with the heavy hitters, but my volunteer work with the fearless fighters mm -hmm. is quite um, generous in terms of what it provides me mm -hmm. and uh, an outlet for my energies. Well, if it's okay, um, I hope I, I can give you a few minutes. I'd love to give you a few minutes to touch on some of your work with the fearless fighters. To uh, tell us a little bit about that. Well, I, on the first day of the fearless fighters volunteering, I remembered seeing somebody coming in in a wheelchair and I ran out to the car and I thought, you know, how do I put them at ease accepting my help? And I thought about it and just quickly said, you know, hi, I'm Bill Corsi. I'm a volunteer, but I also have Parkinson's. And, mm -hmm. and a smile came over the face of the gentleman who's 90 years old. And we wheeled him into the facility and I spent the entire time with him exclusively mm -hmm. walking him through the program and the exercises and, and it was just as enriching to me as what I was told it was for him and mm -hmm. his daughter who was there as a corner person mm -hmm. for his activities and oh, yeah you're well you're helping others but it also um, is enriching and benefiting you and feeling um, productive, useful, and resourceful to others. So I think that's fantastic. And that's certainly what the goal is of Power of Parkinson's, just trying to um, help others and feel like we're making a little bit of a dent in our community as you are. Well, it got um, me out of the house after several years of being isolated from society. Sure. It got me out of the house. And in fact, between the volunteer work and my regular classes, sometimes I'm going five times a week to the rock steady boxing. Mm -hmm. So I have a place to get up and go to every morning. Yeah. So you led me right into the next question. Prior to isolation and this time of social distancing, tell us a little bit about you, what your workout regimen was when you could leave the house and there wasn't this isolation going on. Well, it was usually uh, getting to class about an hour and a half early so mm -hmm. I could communicate with those that came in. Um, early as well mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. there was that comradeship mm -hmm. and then I'd go through the exercise program and then I'd go home and usually unwind for a bit take mm -hmm. maybe a quick nap yeah and um be ready to tell my wife what I had done for the day mm -hmm. and um so it, it gave me a basis and a foundation for getting started every morning whereas before I didn't have any direction mm -hmm. and having been in sales before where I was forced to be in a direction all the time it was so limiting when I became afflicted with this mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that it's, it was a marked improvement me just getting out of the house and yeah doing. yeah I'm sure that well the benefits were probably twofold in terms of your boxing and you're getting that physicality the movement the exercise but you're also getting that social piece that's so important to your overall well-being I remember going up to a gentleman, your father, mm -hmm. and asking him how he's hit so well with the speed bag. And mm -hmm. so he showed me and worked with me and got me a little bit up to speed. And, yeah. and that's the kind of uh, attitude that goes on yep. in the Rocksteady program. And everybody's a friend at heart, but they're there to help you and their family. Mm -hmm. they're, they're there to tell you when you're doing wrong as well mm -hmm. so you in the which is okay <laughs> that's wonderful thank you for sharing that uh so now conversely tell us a little bit about your workout regimen now that we're all home we have to make do with our resources so how are you staying active the best you can well i'm usually still getting up at between 5 30 and 6 o'clock in the morning okay so I can have my coffee and get myself mentally up for the exercise program of the day that, okay. that we're doing through Zoom, mm -hmm. as well as uh, we've got YouTube videos that have been taped. And so we can do those in the off days. And mm -hmm. so, um, so I'm finding that my, since we're not supposed to be out and about, I'm finding that I'm not running the roads as much as I used to, but mm -hmm. I find that I'm spending time during the day 
not only doing the exercises, but also doing the mental challenges that they provide us mm -hmm. to do that we are due at the end of each week, oh, keep good. us active. And yeah, so they're making us be accountable for our time off. Good, good. That's wonderful. Uh, I think uh, the YouTube videos and for our listeners, Pop has a YouTube channel as well. Um, and we've put prior workouts, Zoom workouts that we've done on there, as well as an array of other different types of workouts for people with Parkinson's. But the YouTube, the um, Zoom workouts, uh, any technological outlet that we that is available, I think is uh, so wonderful. And it's such a it's such a, you know, technology sometimes have these bad connotations as far as um, uh, in other areas, but I think what a blessing the technology is now with Zoom, YouTube, and other areas that you, people with Parkinson's can stay active. So I think it's fantastic that you touched on that and, and a lot of the resource, online resources that are right at everyone's fingertips. Um, it keeps so, us accountable. Exactly, exactly. And some of those, I know with Power of Parkinson's the live, and I know Richmond Rock Study is doing some live classes. And with the Power of Parkinson's live Zoom on Saturdays, um, you can, with it being live, the you can communicate with one another, and it's nice to to hold each other accountable and at least see each other. And um, and if they didn't show up, you can say where were you over text. So uh, I think it's definitely a way to hold each other accountable and and enjoy seeing one another on the screen. Um, so tell me, being a person with Parkinson's disease, what's been the hardest part about the quarantine right now for you? Probably the loss of the activities surrounding the Power Over Parkinson's Foundation mm -hmm. um, would be the biggest thing because I found that I was doing um, several of the activities and was um, preparing for them or helping um, mm -hmm. with picking out the uh, venues and that sort of thing. and all that has gone now. Um, so now we're just hoping for the best to occur with um, the forced distancing mm -hmm. that maybe would allow Pop to come to the foreground. But Pop is doing with this Zoom program, I think they're making an effort to keep in front of the public. Mm -hmm. So um, it's keeping us accountable still until we can get back on the golf courses and yeah, the miniature golf courses and the bowling alleys. Yeah. And I can echo that for those who are listening. Uh, Bill's involvement in POP has been great as far as identifying places for our Parkinson's Activity League and other ways. So, um, But Bill, don't feel like your help has stopped because now you're doing a pop profile and still helping pop in, in other ways and in ways that we've had to adapt. So, um, you know, we certainly appreciate your continued support and help. Um, so what's been one thing you've done to remain positive during this time? I think the biggest thing is um, I've been putting off writing a book and I've started to get my thoughts in order and organize. I'm going to write the book finally. Okay. So I'm going to try to use this as a springboard to doing something that I've been procrastinating for years doing. Okay. Well, you've just put out uh, your very first marketing uh, piece now that you've said it. So <laughs> we all know about it and we're going to be waiting for that publication date. Accountability. That's right. That's fantastic. Um, I think, uh, what you're saying hopefully will resonate with others in terms of picking up something that we've all put off. Um, so that's great. If you could wave um, a magic wand and uh, what would you say would be the first symptoms of Parkinson's that you would like to eliminate or you'd like researchers to solve? What would be the one symptom if you can eliminate one symptom? Bless your heart for asking. Um, I definitely <laughs> and I know there's an array of them, and we could, you could mention anything, and I'm okay with it. <laughs> the biggest thing with me is uh, somebody who used to pride himself in walking across the floor and at a party and mm -hmm. being composed and looking well kept. Now I feel like I'm judged. That I look like I've been drinking, and I say definitely the gait disturbance. Sure. That has occurred and mm -hmm. loss of coordination. 
and having been out on a tennis court for six to eight hours some days and now I can't even stop myself from walking across the floor in the kitchen without right. bumping into something right it's just a horrible limitation that if I could wave that wand I would yeah. want that to take care of itself I understand that. Well, I know there's plenty of wonderful researchers right in our backyard with VCU and UVA. So hopefully we'll, we'll get there one day. Um, my final question, what would you say you've experienced? Would you say you've experienced any overall silver linings with having Parkinson's disease? So um, anything that's just been a positive outcome of this um, uh, diagnosis? Well, I used to consider myself very receptive to other people's issues, but having gone through this and going through this on a steady basis mm -hmm. has given me an appreciation for those people that I've seen that have been handicapped mm -hmm. in some way, shape, or form and continue to function and how difficult it really is for them to function. Mm -hmm. um, and I have a better appreciation of that now. Sure. I always used to look up at God and say to him when I was in a day when I was pitying myself, mm -hmm. I'd look up to God and say, okay, I got your message when I would see some young man walking by me, hobbling with crutches and that sort of thing, mm -hmm. that I could definitely say that um, I've had a change of heart and can appreciate the trials and tribulations of those people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's wonderful. An increased level of empathy and understanding is certainly a silver lining in uh, what we all should have. But I think it's wonderful that you've you know taken this diagnosis and been able to um, empathize a little bit more with folks. And we could all do better at that uh, with, in, in our lives. So, um, well, Bill Corsi, thank you so much for joining us um, for the Power Over Parkinson's pop profile. And we can't thank you enough. And please know that you were and are and certainly continue to be uh, a pop advocate, uh, a pop supporter, a pop um, friend. So we thank you for doing this pop profile interview. Well, thank you, Margaret, for having me. Thank you.